Welcome to Butchell Park Baptist Church. We are the body of Christ, an inclusive community of faith rooted in the love of Jesus Christ, growing, serving, and transforming lives. Good morning. Good morning, church. Psalms 118 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. And out of my distress I called unto the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. Good morning, church. My name is Kevin Adams. I am each one minister of Congregation of Care. And I want to welcome all of our friends, family, visitors, and those who are joining us online. I want to say to you, God loves you, and we love you too. Amen. We welcome you into this sacred space today. Now, I have the task of uh, ushering us into today's worship service, but I want to take a pause quickly and update you all on some changes uh, that we're bringing in so that we can stay in person. All right. So there's some um, new guidelines we're going to follow. The first is we got to remember to keep all of our masks on. And we are encouraging everyone to kind of spread out and to sit only with families. Uh, we, won't, we won't be doing any congregational singing. Uh, but I remember the scripture that says, if I don't cry out, the rocks cry out. So, which means even though uh, we, might, we might not be able to sing out loud, but we can sing with our hearts and our minds. Amen? Amen? And so we are still going to remember today that what God's love endures forever. So it doesn't matter what changes come. I know everything is kind of topsy-turvy. We don't know. <laughs> How things are going to pan out, but guess what? God loves and endures forever. Amen, church? Amen. And so I want to leave you with this last text, 1 Samuel uh, verse 6 after, after chapter 25. It says, And though you shall greet them, peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be be to all that you have. Beloved, would you join me in, from a social distance? Uh, would you stand up and welcome someone and pass the peace? May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. If you would please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. God built the heavens, the earth, and everything in them. God calls us to be builders as well. God calls us to build our lives. We restore broken places and continue to grow. God calls us to build our faith. Say the word and ponder its interpretation. God calls us to build our community. God calls us to build history by fulfilling the promises of Scripture. Just as we see your wisdom and glory in nature around us, God, may we hear your word for us in words of these readings, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may be drawn closer to you. Through your great preacher, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Today's reading from Psalms is from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing in heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Much to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover by them is your servant Lord. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I should be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord my rock, and my redeemer. This is the word of our Lord. sing just a little talk with Jesus and we're going to invite you as we sing to clap along with us. So we're going to get some rhythm going in here. We'll wake everybody up who's still asleep.
Is everybody awake now? Good. <laughs> We're going to have a time of prayer together, so I hope you're, you're wide awake. And I was thinking as uh, Jackson was doing that the tambourine there of Miriam dancing as they entered the wilderness. I don't know if anybody else had that image. Would you pray with me? God of the wilderness, you welcome us into a journey of discernment. You call us to restore things that are broken. You invite us to proclaim your vision of a world made new. Create in us new hearts and strong voices. Fill us with the power of your spirit as we seek the purpose of our church and of our very lives. Because at the foundation of it all, you are the reason we gather. Your kingdom is the reason we serve. Your love is the reason we care about our neighbors. We know that this faith of ours is so much more than just being nice or kind or even generous. It's more than doing good or being good. It is about you. It is about the love of God, the hope of Jesus, and the empowerment of the Spirit in our lives. So we strive to share your love through authentic community with one another, truly and deeply caring about the people around us. We seek to share your love through worship of the heart and by allowing ourselves to be vulnerable as we are stretched and challenged to see your vision in a new way. We work to share your love by sharing, serving our neighbors and sharing with our neighbors the bread of life that you have so often offered to us in so many tangible ways. God of resurrection, make us the body of the risen Christ. Unite us in all our diversity. Animate us by your spirit so that together we may work toward your coming kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you pray together with me our prayer of confession? God of our restoration, whenever we come home to you, we realize how far we have strayed and how much we have forgotten of your law and your love. We have not loved you with our whole hearts or loved our neighbors as ourselves. Heal us. Heal us and restore us to our relationship with you. In Jesus Christ, and God's word does not come to condemn us, but to make us wise, reviving our souls and rejoicing our hearts. God's word has been fulfilled among us in Jesus Christ, who sets us free to live in accord with, accord with God's own jubilee. So today, we are not going to have godly play for all of you kids, but I would like for our kids to pay a special attention right now, and for our families to pay special attention, and for everybody to pay special attention, because we are going to continue in prayer together with an activity that I adapted from Tracy Smith's Faithful Families and Sybil, Sybil Macbeth's Praying in Color. And this is for everybody, not just our kids. So first, what you're going to need is this piece of paper. And if anybody doesn't have that piece of paper, I'm going to send this around. Raise your hand if you do not have this piece of paper. Everybody's been guessing at what it is. Anybody need one? And you're going to need something to draw or to color with. Um, Jackson, will you get, if you would like to color as part of this activity. I have some crayons that will also be coming around. If coloring is not your thing, that's okay. Drawing is just fine too, but if you would like crayons, they're coming around. We're going to pray today in a little bit of a different way. Today we are here at church and worshiping at home, and we're doing all that we can to keep ourselves and others safe and healthy. And I know that our kids have been working at home, learning at home. Our teachers have been teaching in empty classrooms. 
that all the things that we have been doing, wearing masks, keeping apart from one another, have been challenging at times. And in this, in this other month, in this renewed time of trying to keep each other safe. So there is a verse in the Bible that says, God will cover you with God's feathers. And under God's wings, you can hide. Hear that again. God will cover you with God's feathers. And under God's wings, you can hide. So today, we're going to have an activity. Does everybody have what they need to get started? Today we remember that God loves us and God protects us. Like a mother bird protects her baby and under her wings and in her nest. So on one side of your piece of paper, you're going to see the outline of a bird. If you'd rather draw your own bird, you can turn it on the other side of the paper. Using a pencil or a crayon or whatever you have, I want you to write your name inside that bird. And as you feel led, you can begin to doodle around your bird or to color your bird. You can make it as simple or as detailed as you like. You might outline your bird. You might begin to draw feathers or dots, or lines, or squiggles on your bird. <coughs> there are no rules. What you see up on the screen is simply what I chose to do, but yours may look completely different. Inside that shape with your bird, write a name for God. You might just write God, but there are many names for God. Jesus, Lord, Spirit, Savior, Father, Mother. Write the name that you want to pray today.
And if you want to, you can add an adjective to a describing word for that name. A word like Almighty God, or loving, or holy, or precious. I wrote loving God on mine, but you can write whatever you like. as you want in the following moments. Continue to work on your drawing as I pray these words. God, you love us like a mother bird, holding us close under your wing, keeping us safe in your nest. Thank you that even when we are learning at home or working at home, even when we have to change things yet again, even when we aren't sure what is happening around us or how we should respond. We know that you are there with us. You care for us. And you never leave us alone. Cover us with your feathers. Hide us under your wing. In Jesus' name we pray.
Jesus' name we pray.
main statement for the gospel reading. Be reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Christ answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor, and said to him, all these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you once again for having me, and thank you, thank you, Mutual Park Baptist Church, for being a part of the 45 congregations that make up the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of Kentucky, doing work for Christ all across our state and across our world. We greatly appreciate your partnership with us, and your partnership with, with us is what makes us who we are. So hear this word of thanks. Last week we spent some time talking about the wilderness talking about how one of the things that happens in the wilderness is we find out who God is. We find out the power of God. We find the call of God. But the other part of being in the wilderness is we learn more about who we are in the wilderness. That there's something revealed about us in the wilderness. And while Abraham responded to the call of God to go into the wilderness for a time of discerning God's power, it was also a time for him to discern who he was, which is precisely where we are today. Having read the story from the Gospels about Jesus' temptation or testing in the wilderness, Jesus experienced the wilderness. It, it might surprise you to know when Jesus experienced the wilderness. We tend to think that you have wilderness experiences as just kind of the run of bad luck. You bottom out somewhere in the wilderness. But Jesus experiences the wilderness when? Jesus experiences the wilderness immediately after the high point of his life. Because the wilderness comes immediately after Jesus' baptism. And at that baptism, Jesus rises from the water and hears that he is God's beloved child. In the wilderness. And then the Spirit leads him into the wilderness. That's the way Matthew has it, because Matthew's kind of a nice, gentle guy and doesn't want to make you alarmed. Mark says that Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. They didn't have a choice about the matter. That it was time for the wilderness, that he had just gone from learning that he was God's special child, the Son of God. To the wilderness where he spends 40 days without anything to eat or to drink. 40 days. Matthew seems to think he needs to add, and he was famished. Well, I guess so. 40 days and 40 nights without food, he's driven into the wilderness to be tempted, some translations say. To be tempted that the wilderness is a place where 
there are temptations, choices that you can make that aren't healthy or good. We all are tied to wilderness. I mean, we don't have parched tongues this morning. None of us have come in with red faces or burnt skin. None of us have that kind of wilderness experience today, but we come in the wilderness of COVID, a world that seems to spin out of our control, personal wildernesses of children who have struggles, diagnoses we weren't prepared for and have no idea what we're going to do with now, fear about finances, us know wildernesses and all of us know what it feels like to be famished and all of us can end up here in the congregation hoping that God will reveal God's self once and for all and in this moment we will be out of the wilderness and all will be well but instead of God appearing in the wilderness to Jesus is a time of testing a time of temptation. You aren't tempted by things you don't want to do. I'm not tempted to steal your trash. I'm tempted, however, to have donuts on a Sunday morning before I preach just because I need that extra little bit of sugar. I'm tempted by a lot of things. Some of them don't matter in the big scheme. But some of them, some of those temptations can change the course of my entire life. Jesus is called into a time of temptation where a shine is going to be put on things that will help him think about himself as being better and more powerful than God has just declared him to be. Will Jesus take it? it it's easy for us to in the wilderness to succumb to temptations. So if you're in the wilderness, it's easy to get involved in alcohol or drugs. Or if you're like me, lots of sugar. They used to say the sophomore 15, I think everybody's got the COVID 25. <laughs> you're tempted to do things that aren't really going to help, but that will make you feel better. But maybe it's not temptation in the wilderness. Maybe it's testing, too. That's another way you can translate the word is to test. And when I test students at college, I, I give them a test, not for them to show me what they don't know, but for them to show me what they do know. It's a way for me to reveal how prepared they are and reveal what they've been able to do so that I can celebrate with them when they do the things that I've asked them to do. So Jesus goes into the wilderness for testing. There's an old saw that people often say, and that is that hard times develop character. And there's some truth to that. I mean, I think you can really develop character as you go through difficult times. But there was a football coach once who had a better take on it than that. Than that. He said, hard times don't develop character they reveal the character that is already there. And so the wilderness does in some ways build us, but the other thing the wilderness does is it reveals us. And how we act in between, when we don't know exactly where we're going and don't know exactly what the next step is, that is a revelation of our character through the testing of the wilderness. So Jesus has been told, you are my son at his baptism. And now he finds himself in the wilderness, in this time of testing. He is tested there, we are told, by an malevolent force. It's interesting, the Greek uses two words. It uses the word devil, diabolos, which means slanderer, or someone who doesn't tell the truth about someone else. The other, the last word is Satan which means adversary. And so during Jesus' first two tests, the word is used slanderer, 
as if Jesus' test is someone saying something that's not true to him. And in the last test, it is the adversary that someone is coming up against him. This level of force that wants Jesus to be something other than the Son of God. That malevolent force that wants Jesus in the wilderness to take control of his own destiny and do what he wants to do as opposed to taking the name that he has been given by God at baptism. To become more than he is. That is a fear of the wilderness. Is that you will suddenly think that you can figure it out yourself. And you don't need anybody else. It's a fear for churches. That in the wilderness they look for all sorts of easy answers. Things that satisfy in the short term. But things that don't really matter to God. They reveal themselves to be pulled along by the currents of society. And what the society sees is important. And what society says is success. And say, we need the higher minister who's going to do these things with us. As opposed to, we need to remember that we are God's children. So what am I talking about? Let's talk about the first temptation. Jesus is there. He's not eating in 40 days, 40 nights. And Satan comes to him. Actually, the devil comes to him and says, Diabolos, the slanderer, says, If you are the Son of God, what is the slander? The slander is, He is the Son of God. There's not an if. Jesus wasn't baptized and come out of the water, and God says, If you do this, you'll be my child. He comes out of the water, and He is God's child. He doesn't have to do anything to claim it, to own it, to be to show it to other people, to be in charge rather than God being in charge. If you are the Son of God, the devil says, turn these stones into bread. It's interesting that if you look at the miracles that Jesus did, C.S. Lewis wrote that the miracles that Jesus did with nature were all nature, natural processes, either sped up or turn backwards on themselves. So, for example, when Jesus turns the water into wine, water turns into wine and it falls from the sky and grows into a grape and gets fermented. When Jesus still the storms, storms come and storms go. When Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish, it's a way that fish multiply. And yeast multiplies. So when Satan tempts Jesus and says, turn these stones into bread, he's asking Jesus to do something outside of God's natural created order. Because stones don't turn into bread. He's asking Jesus to feed himself from something that's not really food. And he's asking Jesus to do it not just once for his food, but to turn stones into bread. How much bread does a person need? Satan wants Jesus to think that he can provide for himself everything he needs all the time and not have to trust in God for things. And it's easy in the wilderness for the church to lose sight that its primary purpose is trusting God. Because we can spend a lot of time thinking about plans and how we're going to change things and how we're going to make things work better and how we're going to solve all of our problems. In fact, we live in a society that tells us that technology is the answer to every single problem. And the problem is technology, if you haven't noticed. We are smart people who can really think through a lot of things and come to a lot of great conclusions but we cannot provide for our needs apart from God. Jesus responds to the slanderer who said, if you are the Son of God, saying to him, don't you read the Scriptures? 
People don't live by bread alone. Notice Jesus didn't say people don't live by bread. He, he made it clear that there is still those needs. And the church should be about finding those needs and meeting those needs. But if you spend all of your life meeting people's needs and never spend your life thinking about your relationship with Christ and how that relationship affects other people and offering that blessing of that relationship to other people, you are being tested and shown to be lacking. Because the church is not just another social service organization. There are a lot of good social service things that a church can do and should do, but they can't do those things alone. They can only do those alongside the Word of God. And that's what makes the difference. Satan says, hey, church in the wilderness, get busy meeting people's needs. God says, you know, if you feed somebody, they'll be hungry tomorrow. But if you give them eternal hope, they'll have hope forever. So feed them today and bring them hope. In the wilderness, Jesus is tested to turn bread into stone. He's tested to stand on the top of the temple and jump off. That'd be quite a sight. Quite a spectacle. And, and it's really simple for churches who are sometimes concerned about numbers and uncertain about the future to think, if we can just create a big enough spectacle, people will come. And the truth is, people will come to spectacles. They won't stay for spectacles. Unless you can figure out some way to do an even bigger one next week. Because people who are searching for spectacle can always find something bigger and something greater. There's a church in Lexington that went through a time where it was the church for everybody to go to. One of their big things was a celebration each year called Cuesta Palooza, a gigantic carnival. And they're right by a major road there and they had a crane. And on the crane, they lifted a car and they gave away a car at the end of Quest of Lots of people came. What's happened to that church? It's really struggling and almost gone now because there were some problems with the leadership, because there were other churches who could do bigger spectacles. And now the church has not rooted itself in following God's will, but rooted itself in getting a crowd and judges its value by getting a crowd, doesn't really have much to offer anymore. When the devil says, if you are the Son of God, remember that's the slander, if you are the Son of God, jump off the temple because we know that you won't splat on the stones. The angels will come and get you. Won't that feel good to have our church finally filled with people? But what if the wilderness is telling you that's not who you are? That you're not a people of spectacle, but a people of love and care. And you can do, always do a spectacle and get a crowd. But you can't raise Christians through spectacle. I had a friend telling me one time that the problem with American Christianity is not empty pews. It's empty people in the pews. In the wilderness, the church needs to embrace their role as children of God and to not look for false ways to fill things, but to seek God's presence to fill each of us. Because that's where the power that Jesus had resided. So in the first two temptations, the devil slanders God. If you are the Son of God, but we know that Jesus has been told, you are my Son. And then the last temptation takes a different frame. 
Satan now, the adversary, he takes Jesus to the top of the mountain and says, all of this will be yours if only you will bow to me. You're here in the wilderness, you're stuck, God doesn't care anything about you, why don't you just rule up and ball and die? God will not care for you, but I can give you all of this. Can the adversary give all of that? I don't know. But that's the claim. That in the wilderness, Jesus can become powerful. That Jesus can become the head of nations. That Jesus can be someone who everyone listens to. That in the wilderness, the church can finally have a voice and can speak with power. If only. You line up with the adversary. Jesus will reject that temptation as well, that test. And it is revealed who Jesus is. Jesus is who God said Jesus was, that Jesus is the Son of God. And what happens as soon as the tester, as the adversary leaves? What happens? The angels come and take care of Jesus. If you have a really short memory, you don't recall that in the second temptation, throwing yourself off the temple, it was to make the angels come. What makes the angels come? Jesus embracing who God made him to be. Jesus embracing being God's son in the wilderness and not having to be someone who meets everybody's needs. Not having to be someone who creates a spectacle in the crowd. Not having to be the one who's always in charge. To be God's son for Jesus is enough. And the wilderness test reveals that Jesus is prepared to be Messiah of the world because Jesus knows who Jesus is. When you're in the wilderness, you don't know when it's going to end. Forty days and forty nights, Jesus was in there. I don't think on day 39 he said to himself, I've got one more day. But it will end. And the time will come when you are out of the wilderness. And what you learn in the wilderness about yourself will give you the strength to continue every single day of your life. We live into the blessed notion that God will be with us and that God is with us and that God has made us sufficient for the challenges that we face. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was an interesting guy. We like to think about holy people behaving in holy ways. He was wholly different. Um, for my old-time Baptist upbringing, he was not a teetotaler, um, which is a problem for me and why I didn't turn him to be a Lutheran. Uh, but he was somebody who struggled, struggled mightily with all sorts of problems. He felt that he was always under attack from the demonic forces of the world. He suffered from depression and from anxiety. And yet he is one of the people who people look to and say, this is someone who really understood what it meant to be a Christian. How did he deal with it? In his study, he carved on wood the words, I am baptized. So that whenever he felt like he was in the wilderness, he looked and saw those words. I am baptized. In many church traditions, we pick that up. And it's not uncommon for the minister to say to the congregation, remember your baptism. And for some people, that is something that they can't remember for themselves because they may have been immersed as an infant or sprinkled as an infant. But for some of us, we can remember our baptisms not just through the stories 
of those who love us, but we can remember our baptism because we can feel the water around us. And knowing the uncertainty of sinking into water that covers us, sinking into what would be death, rising out of the water finally, turning our eyes towards heaven, and hearing in an inaudible voice, you are my child. So in the wilderness, there will always be tests that will show who you are. But in the wilderness, remember the right thing to always say is I am a baptized child of God That is enough. I'd ask you to join me in prayer. Good and gracious God, who has called us to the waters of baptism, help us remember our baptism during this time of wilderness. That we know you are with us and that you define us. Help us to move away from the temptations of the wilderness to be something other than you made us. Help us to move away from desires to fill people's needs from the need for spectacle from the desire for power and instead in the wilderness help us find ourselves close to you that your angels will come and minister to us as we remember our baptism it's in Jesus name we pray Amen Sunday, you're invited to respond, to respond to God's call as we continue to follow Jesus and discern what that means for us uniquely as individual people and together as a church. Today, if your response includes a decision to make a profession of faith, to be baptized, or to join this faith community, you're invited, you're invited to join me at the front. We're going to stand and not sing, but Jackson is going to sing one verse of our hymn together, so I would invite you to stand and hear this verse. Community. Join us in participating in God's mission through service to our neighbors near and far. 
Come join us for Bible studies on Sundays and Thursdays. Subscribe to our emails and our newsletter mail out. Get involved in our diverse music ministries. Engage your families in our wonderful children and youth ministries. We want you to be invested. We want you to be connected. Here at Mutual Park Baptist Church, we are an inclusive community of faith rooted in the love of Jesus Christ, growing, serving, and transforming lives.